Howdy, howdy, howdy all. Welcome on in to uh, Goose Talks Film. And this week we are covering the new release film Sting. Uh, it's a bit like Abigail, it's kind of new release, it's kind of not really. It's been out uh, probably a bit over a month now, maybe a bit longer. Um, it is a sibling movie of 2024, so for people that don't, don't know what a sibling movie is, it's pretty much two movies that kind of uh, share the same overall plot line or underlining plot line and are released in a uh, similar time frame. Obviously, this sibling being uh, Sting and Infested, which was the French spider horror movie that I covered uh, probably uh, about a month ago, I reckon now, maybe a bit longer. But uh, So, I don't like to compare movies too much, but uh, as I've said in previous podcasts about sibling movies is I will be uh, kind of comparing because it's just easier to compare. They're released around, around the same time. People might want to only watch one of them, so that's what I'm going to kind of talk about a little bit. It's not going to be a full comparison podcast. I will be mainly talking about Sting itself, but um, I guess the easiest way to kind of describe a few of the pros and the cons will be comparing to Infested's pros and cons. I just think that's just a easy way to do it and uh, easy to follow. Anyway, Sting is an Australian-American production. I think it's, it's majority an Australian movie, from what I can gather. Um, it was helped funded by Screen Australia, and the entire cast is Australian except for Jermaine Fowler, who plays a su- supporting character. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was really excited for this um, a while ago when I did first see the trailers and uh, kind of read up about it. There wasn't really a a lot of hullabaloo about this when it was announced and the cast was announced and because a lot of these Aussie actors are quite well known here in Australia, mainly Ryan Kaur and Noni Hazelhurst. Uh, those two are definitely uh, familiar names within Australia uh, and Australian uh, movie goers and TV goers, mainly TV, especially Ryan Kaur. But uh, for horror fans out there, he is actually the, the protagonist in Wolf Creek 2. So that's where a lot of people probably recognize Ryan Kaur outside of Australia because we know Wolf Creek always does well overseas, particularly in America. But yeah, anyway, so Sting uh, is, like I said, a spider horror movie. It uh, leans more into comedy than what Infested does. Infested was kind of tried to be as realistic and grounded as it could be, whereas Sting, it knows what it is. It's trying to be, you know, the old school creature feature movies from the 70s, 80s, and a little bit of the 90s, where we don't really tend to get a lot of these movies where it's kind of in a secluded um, building or a secluded town or, you know, at a lake or on a boat or something. You know, killer animal movies were really big, like I said, in the 70s because of Jaws. It spawned so many different types of uh, killer animal movies, you know, about bears, snakes, other shark movies. You know, then the 90s, we got a lot of it as well. We had like Anaconda and Deep Blue Sea and... That kind of had a little resurgence there for a bit. Mid-90s to early 2000s, that kind of died off. And we've got a few of... Mainly shark movies is pretty much the only time we get a lot of uh, movie companies willing to spend uh, a bit of money on killer animal movies is mainly sharks. The rest are all, you know, lower budget or the independent or the shitty-ass TV movies like Sharknado and all that. So it's good. To see uh, this movie, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't find what the overall budget for this movie is, but it did make nearly $2 million at the box office, which is probably going to be underwhelming because this does look like it was made for more than that. Uh, comparing it to other horror movies around that time, um, which another Australian movie, uh, Late Night with the Devil, that had a budget, I think, of around $10, $11 million. And I think this is probably a bit lower than that, uh, considering they don't rely on CGI heaps. And it is, this movie entirely takes place in one building. So that would have saved money there. So my guess would be about between four to six million. Could be less, could be more. Not sure what the marketing was like. I definitely, there's a period where I was seeing a lot of this marketed for about a week. <laughs> I think it was about two weeks before it was released. And then I just heard nothing or saw nothing. Like on Twitch, on YouTube, I saw trailers and then done. So they didn't spend a lot of money on marketing. But anyway. Uh, so, more into the plot line. Um, this is a short plot from IMDb. After raising an unnervingly talented spider in secret, 12 year old Charlotte must face her facts about her pet and fight for her family's survival when the once charming creature rapidly transforms into a giant 
flesh-eating monster. So, I mean, as you can tell from the plot line there, uh, it kind of takes itself seriously in certain parts and it knows what it is in other parts. And I can appreciate that. I don't mind that. It's just I wish they kind of picked a tone and kind of stuck with it. And I don't mind a movie either being serious with a bit of, you know, humorous comedy scenes thrown in or the other way around. A comedy movie with a few serious scenes thrown in. It kind of the, the former works better in my opinion, but they can both work uh, depending on the execution. And uh, yeah, like we always do here on Goose Talks Film, I recommend a movie out of three categories, which is go see this at the movies, wait until streaming or don't bother at all. Uh, like I said, I'm a bit late to the party for this. It's probably done its uh, theatre releases kind of everywhere worldwide. You, there might be a few little trinkles of screening somewhere in like major cities and stuff, but I think because it did underwhelm at the box office, it's probably done. But I think this movie is uh, enjoyed, would be enjoyed more with a group of friends or a group of people, if that be at home or if that be at the movies. It's kind of, it's not really a movie thing or a streaming thing. It's kind of more, I think you would enjoy this with a group of friends. You know, you might get scared together. You might like laugh at each other. You might all get jump scared. I think it'd be good fun. This would be a really, really good movie night um, for maybe like a date night or, uh, you know, double date, triple date, or just a group of friends or whatever it is. I think this would be a really good group viewing. Yeah, like I said, if that be at the movies or at home. Um, Look, I still did relatively enjoy this movie uh, to a degree. So, yeah, I... Would I recommend this movie to everyone? Um, Quite a tough one. I think if you have severe arachnophobia... I mean, I have arachnophobia, but I mean, I didn't have any nightmares or dreams after this or I wasn't even really looking over my shoulder or anything like, like that like I was with Infested, mainly because of the type of movie this is. It's a silly movie, whereas Infested, like I said, it, 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 and it's a different type of spider as a villain. Like Infested was an infested, infested building of these massive spiders that all grow rapidly quick and there's different sizes and they kind of is an infestation, <coughs> excuse me, whereas Sting really is using the formula from your original killer animal movies. So like even earlier in the 70s, you know, there was heaps in the 40s, 50s, 60s that kind of had higher budgets and were kind of more widely seen in the 70s because of Jaws, like I said. But yeah, this follows that formula of this is just one animal it rapidly grows. It's kind of hunting and praying in this one building with all these tenants of this apartment building. So, yeah, if you like movies where people are getting picked off one by one, it's kind of technically like a slasher formula where people are getting picked off one by one. And instead of kind of a killer in a mask or an undead person, it's just a rapidly growing giant spider. So, yeah, look, I would recommend this to people that uh, want to maybe make themselves feel uncomfortable a bit. Um it's not going to be, it's, there's not a shit ton of violence. There's maybe a few little gory scenes that might make you feel uncomfortable, but by no means is this like over the top crazy violent or gory or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing uh, really triggering this movie either compared to other movies I've covered on the podcast like Immaculate and some other ones. Except if you have a fear of, uh, like I said, if you have arachnophobia, if you have severe arachnophobia, I wouldn't recommend this because it might fill your head with like shit that's probably not going to happen. But it's we all know what phobias are like. It's kind of you know, it tell your brain tells you things are going to happen or could happen that not I'm putting nine percent probably aren't going to happen. But yeah, look, I um thought this was a decent Australian movie. I think Australia. I love that we're leaning more into horror than we ever have before. I mean, we've we've been doing horror since shit. I think the sixties and seventies, but. It's never really been one where we've been pumping out heaps of movies in the one genre and also willing to put money into it. They are kind of doing that now with Talk To Me, um, which pretty much came out this time last year, maybe a bit late. I think it was July of um, 23. Then you have uh, Late Night With The Devil. Now you have Sting. And there's other ones as well, like the um, Royal Hotel, which was kind of more of a thriller. But we are really leaning more into it and I, I really do uh, appreciate that and by the way my dog Toby says hi if you can hear him barking through the microphone <laughs> because I am doing this as a video and a podcast I can't stop recording or it stuffs everything up so 
I apologise if you can hear me barking. It is switching out, but this is literally the only time I can record this. So I apologise. Anyway, uh, we're not talking about my killer dog. We're talking about a killer spider. Uh, yeah, look, before we get to the spoiler zone, all I'll kind of finish on is um, don't expect to watch uh, an amazing uh, technical movie or anything like that. I think the visual effects are good. I think the practical effects they use is really good. I think there's a balance of CGI when it's needed and practical effects where it's going to work more and it's more effective. So I think they've definitely um, got a good balance there. And I think that's a thing where a lot of killer animal movies either get right or they get severely wrong is overusing CGI or maybe using it when they shouldn't have or probably use it when, you know, I'm kind of ugh, word to fuck myself here. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's kind of what I'll finish on before we get into the spoilers. So here is your spoiler warning. So, anyway, we are going into uh, the more in-depth side of Sting. Uh, yeah, look, I, um, I've, I've written some notes here. I did watch this a few nights ago, so it's not entirely fresh in my brain. Uh, I watched this Thursday. I'm currently recording this on Sunday because it's kind of the only time I could record this. Um, so, everything's not fresh. I'll be kind of relying on my notes I've written here, so I apologize if you're watching the video version on YouTube, which I appreciate. I will be kind of looking at my phone, but I'll try and just quickly read something that should jog my memory. But um, yeah, I think like I've kind of already alluded to, I think unfortunately for, well, I mean, it depends on which one you prefer because they're both very different in their tones and kind of how they use the spider as the villain. Um, but yeah, with Infested, I watched Infested first. So I'm going to have high expectations. I really enjoyed Infested. I thought, yeah, it was a great movie, let alone like, good foreign language movie if you're if you're into them if you're not that's fine but i thought it was like a really good movie in terms of just the characters i think really carried that movie like i said that was more based in realism and and grounded in uh, as much as it could be uh about a movie of uh spiders infesting a building whereas yeah sting I, I, the opening scene or the first time we see the spider in the opening credits it's playing like an old kind of poppy silly song and the meteorite pops through the window and it's the spider kind of in like a an alien. To- I think that's a callback to Alien. I, I could be wrong, but it looks like it's a callback to Alien because the shell slash egg looks very, very similar. Meteorite, whatever you want to call it, looks very similar to the xenomorph slash facehugger um, ones, which I don't mind the callback. I think it's a cool visual. And it lands in a dollhouse and it kind of hatches and the girl finds it. I thought that was really silly. It kind of took me off guard. I didn't realize that the movie was going to be that silly. And it, it didn't... And it was hard to because how are they going to know how the spider got there? But it's kind of... Yeah, it makes it silly. And it, it tells you what kind of movie this is going to be from the start in terms of... Look, a big villain of the movie is a rapidly growing spider, but it arrived at a meteorite that crashed into a fucking dollhouse. Um... I will read the full pl- plot synopsis. It's not as big as what it usually is. Uh, it's only three paragraphs and like one last sentence. So bear with me as usual. I'll read the plot and uh, if it's missing anything, I'll just fill in the gaps. Charlotte, a rebellious 12-year-old girl, lives in a dilapidated apartment building with her overworked stepfather, Ethan, her mother and infant half-brother. Charlotte's often left to her own devices and stumbles upon a tiny spider hatched from a strange glowing object that crash lands in her great-aunt's apartment. Intrigued, she decides to keep the spider as a pet, naming it Sting. As Charlotte cares for Sting, the spider begins to grow at an alarming rate. She initially keeps it at size a secret, but as it becomes more difficult to hide, her father and neighbours start to notice strange occurrences around the building. The spider's growing size and insatiable appetite soon lead to the death of pets and residents. Charlotte's relationship with her stepfather is strained over the the reality of her biological father. During a meltdown from Ethan, Sting attacks both parents while Charlotte is nearby, oblivious with her brother. The tension escalates when Sting, now a gigantic spider, traps several residents in the building using mimicked sounds to lure prey. Charlotte, accidentally uh, learning the spider's weakness from her grandmother, goes on a hunt for her now-missing family. As Charlotte saves Ethan, they face numerous obstacles, including the spider's intelligence and adaptability. During a showdown in the building's basement, Sting attacks the group, resulting in a battle. Charlotte manages to lure Sting into a trap with the help of Ethan. Using a trash compression device, they finally destroy the monstrous spider, but not without sustaining significant significant losses. So, yeah. And, um, look, 
I kind of knew what I was getting into when I watched this movie. I knew from the trailers it was going to be a bit more silly than Infested. It wasn't going to take itself as serious. But like I said, it kind of, with, there's a lot of tonal shifts. It kind of, it didn't want to decide what it wanted to be. Did it want to be a serious movie about a killer spider that rapidly grows in an apartment building killing people with a few funny scenes, a few goofy scenes? Or did it want to be a full silly movie with a few good kills and, you know, and gore and stuff, but it, it didn't execute either. So I think that the tone was a big issue for me, whereas Infested, it knew what it wanted to be. It was a character-driven movie with a lot of social undertones. It made you think about society and societal um, changes that should, need to be made, whatever, and kind of use the spiders to push that narrative where this is just a movie about a killer spider in a building killing people that has a bit of human drama. Two very, very different movies on the movie spectrum. So that's why I say to people, look, if you only want to watch one of them, it really depends on what what type of movie viewer you want and what type of movie you want to consume with you know the short time a lot of people have these days. We're all, what I say, oh, I don't want to speak for everybody or myself, but people are working longer and harder for less money. Me, I'm lucky. I'm in a very good position, but not everyone is like that. So I know one, not everyone can afford to go to the movies. I know people don't have time to go to the movies. They don't, they can't have people look after their kids or because the rest of their family are working, blah, 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 blah. So I think, because I get a lot of people ask me like what movies, no, I'll say that sentence again. I get a lot of people ask me for movie recommendations. I said, look, all depends on your time, all depends on what you want to consume, what type of movie goer you are and what you want to consume. And this one, I would recommend to people that are just horror fans in general. I don't think this is going to um, turn any horror fans away or um, or piss them off or they're not going to sit through it. I think most people would enjoy this. I think most people would find entertaining even just parts of it. I think they'll find at least one aspect they liked. They might like the spider design. They might like how good the visual effects are. They might like some of the kills. They might like the characters. They might like the setting. And like I've spoken about on this podcast before, if you're a frequent listener, listener, I like my horror movies, not all my horror movies, but I like certain horror movies depending on what the storyline, the plot is. I like them to be in confined areas. I think it, it, it shows how good of a writer, producer, director, actor, whatever you are. If you can tell this intricate, well-written and driven story in a confined space or confined area even, like even like a little lakeside town or a uh, underground cave system or a big old mansion, a church, a monastery, whatever. And I think we are getting a lot of these little sub-genre movies now where they kind of, we're getting a lot of these movies that share kind of one setting. And I think the apartment building one is one I really, really do like. We've, we had Infested, we have Sting, we had uh, Evil Dead Rise last year. Now, I really do like movies set in apartment buildings. I think it creates um, a lot of cool things you can work with. You can, uh, you have a lot of people that you can give a little bit of character development to and then you can feed them to the monster killer disease, whatever you know story you're telling. And Infested and Sting both do this quite well. I think Sting did a really, really good job at kind of, they telegraphed who our victims were going to be, but they gave us enough about these um, characters to kind of care enough for them or at least be like, oh yeah, this person deserves to be fucking killed. Oh, and I really hope this person does get killed or just like infested with a few of the neighbors. You're like, oh, fucking hope this dude gets fucking killed or uh, I hope this chick survives because she's really nice. So when you're kind of feeling that type of stuff and when you say it to yourself or say it in your head or say it to whoever you're watching the movie with, that's a good sign for a movie. And I was watching this, I thought, oh, I really like this actor. Like, you know, Jermaine Fowler, who I kind of know as a bit more of a comedian than an actor. And he's, like I said, the only, to my knowledge, only American actor in this. So I think uh, the American uh, production company that was involved in this or distributor, I can't remember, one or two, they probably would have said, hey, you can use Australian actors, that's fine, but we just want one American actor to kind of bridge that to American viewers. So they're kind of someone they're familiar with, even though he's not a massive name, but that's what happens a lot. So, uh, yeah, look... um, I thought that a lot of the kills were really good. Uh, they weren't overly graphic. Um, I mean, oh, probably some were, but I did like the uh, 
the neighbor who had a lot of uh, animals in his apartment who was doing tests on, where it was all dark and gloomy and creepy in his apartment. Uh, Eric, I think his name was. I thought he was a, an interesting character. Uh, I don't think we got explanation enough as to why he was a person who did experiments, blah, blah, blah. And that, I mean, that's probably why, but I, it was kind of a big curve or a swerve, what do you want to call it, that he dobbed Charlotte in for having the spider to her dad. So the dad knew that Eric kept the spider, but Eric said he was going to give it to the right authorities. But he kept it and he fed it because he wanted to get bigger. It's kind of like, okay, well, a bit more explanation on the character and why he would want to do that. But I guess I would just read into it as like, okay, he's experimenting, he's into experiments, blah, blah, blah. But what I don't get about that is when he was experimenting on the fish was because he wanted to cure, I can't remember exactly what it was, but cure something, something to do, a spine disease or something, right? Or a bone disease, something like that. What's growing a venomous, huge spider going to achieve? Unless you just want to kind of, you're intrigued. But answer we didn't get, but I thought it wasn't really a major issue. It's just something I want to, I want to bring up. I found it a, just a little bit frustrating. So Eric was a good character and, then his death was pretty much off screen, which he was kind of the neighbor we mainly saw other than family. But yeah, anyway, I thought uh, having an exterminator as a side character was, it probably wasn't a direct callback to the um, 1990 Arachnophobia movie, but um, which was obviously John Goodman in Arachnophobia. I just had a mental blank then. John Goodman in Arachnophobia, where he, he was kind of a goofy um, exterminator who helps him and stuff, whereas Jermaine Fowles were a goofy in kind of a different way. Kind of, you're not sure if he's a douchebag or if he's just eccentric, but it turns out he's a bit of a douchebag because he pretty much sacrifices uh, Ryan Corr and, and Charlotte so he can survive, but he gets a, a pretty gruesome death. I think the, um, the trash compactor uh, was probably a bit too par- uh, paragraphed, telegraphed for my liking from the start with because obviously Ryan Kaur's, um character he's like a comic book artist slash writer um, by kind of trade but it's kind of his side project at the moment while he's trying to get funding and get them printed so he's working as the, like the super um, slash handyman for the apartment complex and yeah he, pretty much the boiler and also the trash compactor aren't really working probably I thought okay well that trash compact is going to come into play uh, and it did. It pretty much is what kills the spider. And I thought, look, I understand that you kind of have to show the audience. And I, I love that stuff. I love when they subtly do it. This was just kind of, okay, they kind of focus on it too much and made it too much of a point where they are just telegraphing it too much. But um, what else have I got here? Uh, yeah, the characters in this definitely felt more like horror movie characters or just movie characters in general as opposed to the realistic people that I could um uh what's the word I could uh relate to in infested whereas these were movie characters and that might sound weird and it's kind of hard to explain but if you know you know where it's like you're watching a movie like oh yeah these are written like movie characters they're they're fitting into this movie for whatever reason whereas it infested in other type of movies you're like oh these are people that just feel like they're out of real life put into a movie where yeah this didn't really feel like that at all um i think the old lady the the um mother the grandmother she was a mother of the uh, of charlotte's mother that's a, a lot of mothers in that one sentence um did make for like an entertaining scene for like the uh, spider killing three exterminators at the start and then obviously well we think that jermaine fellow gets killed but he comes back later but so it jumps in back four days, which I thought was interesting for a movie like this to to tell that type of story, to kind of start with one scene, then backtrack, and then we kind of hit the opening scene kind of three quarters in. I didn't mind it. You know, I, it didn't really change my experience, good or bad, to be honest. One one bit of that annoys me, though, because I might have missed a line. Uh, it might have just been one line explaining it, but I missed it if they did do it, where Jermaine Fowler, he bombs the building, does it, and they don't want to pay him, whatever. And then he comes back later on when the grandmother calls him and there's other exterminators there and we see him, see them that one's already been killed and one pretty much gets killed in, uh, on screen in front of us. Well, I don't remember them getting called in unless the evil um, 
aunt, you know, the grandmother's sister called them in because she didn't want to pay Joanne Fowler's prices, but they kind of just rocked up just to be kind of victims. And I, I may have missed a line. I may have, but other than that, there was no explanation why there was other exterminators there unless the grandmother called them first and then called him and forgot they were there. I, I don't know. I don't know. They just didn't really explain it that good. But I thought, yeah, the grandmother having dementia and kind of forgetting that she even called anyone there to be killed was a nice touch. Um, <clears throat> uh, I do. I did appreciate the small uh, scale tracking shots where you're kind of following a character, th- character through their little apartment building or through a hallway or when they're following Ryan Core um, in the, the basement when he's near the trash compactor and all that. I thought, yeah, I thought some of the shots were cool. I thought they were nice engaging shots, nice establishing shots. So I thought it was good for a movie like this to do um, cinematography that good. Um, I like the fact that they, they technically weren't snowed in because the exterminator left and came a couple of times. But I like the fact that the snow added to kind of them kind of being stuck inside. They really couldn't do anything else other than go to work and come back. But both parents worked from home. Um, so I thought that was a nice touch where they're all kind of stuck in the building and that kind of adds to the whole terror of it all. Um, I thought that the spider um, imitating noises that it hears and then using it to lure prey is a nice touch because we know spiders don't do that specifically, but do other things to lure prey in, like trapdoor spiders, um, bird-eating spiders and all that will do different ways to lure uh, their prey in. So I thought having this alien top spider, I mean, that's what it is. That is its way to lure prey in, and it's very effective. I think it's cool. It's different. I haven't seen that in a spider movie before, or even really a lot of killer animal movies before. So I thought, yeah, that was really cool. It, it obviously imitated a cat. Um, it had its little... Uh, the creepy scene where it does the noise when it's like feeding time, I thought was quite cool. Uh, yeah, so I, th- I, I like that. I thought that was cool. I thought that was different. It was a breath of fresh air. It kind of gave the movie a bit of originality, which is good when you're doing a movie about spiders. When we've had a few in the past, but not a lot lately. Um, I thought the main the main girl, Charlotte, I thought she was annoying in the sense I couldn't read what type of character she was. I don't know if that comes down to the acting or the writing or both, but... It's kind of like some scenes, her facial expression and the way they're shooting it makes her feel like she's this evil character that wants everyone to be killed. She's using this spider as her kind of henchman to kill these people that pissed her off. And then other scenes, it's kind of like, no, she's just a kid that's going through problems because she wants to love her stepdad, but she's finding it hard. She thinks her dad is living in Thailand, but he's literally only a 20-minute drive away. But they don't do a good enough job in telling us what this girl's thing is. And she's 12, I know, so she's going through a lot of stuff. She's not an adult yet, so she's still adapting to certain things. But I thought the actress did a good job in certain scenes. And I think when you're directing and, and writing for kid actors and stuff, you really need to look after them and protect them and all that. I don't think they did a good enough job here. I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't think they did a good a good enough job. Um the lady, the the um, neighbor we see that uh, doesn't doesn't say how, how or why or anything like that, but she's lost her, her sons. We don't know if the, the father just left or he died as well, but we know she lost her, two of her sons. Um, <clears throat> anyway, she gets bitten and then she hits her head on the bath in the bathroom and then the spider going in her mouth and then kind of eating her insides and fuck her. That, that was gruesome. That was probably the most messed up scene in the whole movie that we got. And I thought that was really cool. I thought that was effective. When you're <clears throat> doing a movie like this, I think it's really important to have this animal, as it's adapting, as it's getting bigger, blah, 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 it does different things. And I think the way it kills people from size to size is really cool. I think it's really effective. When it was smaller, it obviously it killed this woman. It, it bit her, then it went inside of her when she was kind of paralyzed and fucked her up from the inside. It killed the animals as it was getting bigger. And then as it got its huge size, that's when it was putting whole size humans, adults in cocoons and then eating them when it was hungry. So I liked how it was like what animals do when, when they're growing up, when they're getting bigger, they adapt to certain things and to their environment and they, they're hunting differentiate. So 
I did like that aspect. I thought, aspect. I thought it was really cool. Very gruesome, gruesome scene. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, like I said, we don't see a lot of the other neighbors much, but we know enough about them to care for them and, and be like, okay, they seem like real neighbors in this, you know, weird group of collective neighbors. If we're all gathered on the same floor, but so with the lady that lost her family, then we have um, Eric, the wannabe scientist or whatever he is. I don't think he's an actual scientist, but then we have the two elderly women, which is the grandma and then the evil aunt. And then we have our main family that we focus on. And then we have Jermaine Fowler as he's the outside character, he's the exterminator, which I think was a good balance of all that. So good job. Um, yeah, I think Eric snitching on Charlotte, like I said earlier, and then feeding the spider made for a really creepy scene. Like, that was really creepy when it just cuts to Eric. And I think he throws a rabbit or a mouse in there. I, I, I was really quick. I didn't quite see it. But it throws something live in there. The spider's in the corner, and then it jumps off. You hear the, <coughs> like, the splatter noise, and you see blood go everywhere. And you see Eric go, yeah, eat more, more. And it's like, whoa, this is creepy. The next scene we see of the spot in Eric's apartment is it's in this little tiny, well, it's the same enclosure, but it looks tiny now because we see the outline, like figure of the spider, and it's huge, like it's it's barely contained and then it shatters the um, containment, containment that it's in. It was really cool. I thought it was really creepy that we didn't actually see the spider yet. It was just the outline of it. It was, yeah, just a shadow and I thought it was really cool. We didn't really get um, over the top um, exposure of the spider like I always say with these type of movies in general and, and horror when it comes to killers and stuff is less is more so I think this movie did another good job of that um, so props um, I think a scary fact I thought of to myself was I don't know if this is official or not with infested but just from just visual the spiders infested looked like they were based off of huntsman's and the spider in this was obviously clearly based on a redback. It's literally just a redback in design. That's what it is. And they're both common spiders here all throughout Australia. Like, you can find both these species pretty much anywhere in Australia, in any state, in certain areas or whatever. So, I think it's really scary that two fucking spiders that were focused on as villains in horror movies are both here in Australia. So, yep, that's really scary thing about Uh Is yeah, what, what I appreciate about Sting, um, as opposed to Infested, is we do get these little uh, goofy scenes that are entertaining, blah, 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 whereas Infested was very, like I said, I've said a million times, Infested was grounded and um, reality-based and uh, he wanted to care about the characters. He wanted you to be devastated and gut-wrenched when these characters got killed. Sting is like, hey, you see this person? Yeah, they're going to get fucked up by this spider in different ways. Just watch. So two very different approaches. I thought... I yeah, I appreciated the goofiness of this movie, and I could enjoy the goofiness because it wasn't too serious. So, I thought the scene where uh, Ethan and the mom are having a big fight because Charlotte and Ethan just had a big spiel about him being a stepdad and not a real dad, and blah blah blah. And then she goes off. She's sitting next to the baby. I can't remember the the um the baby brother's name, but she's in there with the dog of the woman neighbor that was found dead. They hit her head in the bathtub. So those three in the room. And then we see the parents arguing. And then we see the shot of the spider, which is probably the most we've seen of it since it's been this big. And it comes in on the roof. And then it, it captures both of them while they're all in the next door room. And she has, child has no idea because the headphones are in. I thought that kind of left field. And when I first watched it, I thought, oh my God, that's killed off both parents in one full, like, full sweep. But... To that point, we hadn't seen that it was cocooning the adults yet, or humans. And then we eventually see that it had cocooned um, Gunter, I think her name was, or something like that. They were playing Russians or, or Polish, or I'm not quite sure, I apologise. But that's when you say, oh shit, it's cocooning people like it was with the bugs in the jar, that's crazy. But at first I thought, wow, that's balls to kill both parents off, and I appreciated it more. Then when I found out, oh, they're not really dead, blah, blah, blah. I kind of it ruined the scene a little bit, but I thought it was... Like a really rapid scene, like because they're arguing. I thought that scene did a good job of kind of what a real life argument would kind of look like and sound like in this type of situation, what they were arguing about. And then it kind of ends, and then boom, Spider comes in, steals both parents, and it's kind of that's the start of the climax of the movie. So, really enjoyed that scene. Um, that this is the bit I don't like, just. 
very silly. There could have been different ways to get to the point you wanted to execute. But like I said, it 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 bites all the other humans and cocoons them and all that, and it's quite rough with them and whatever. It, we see that with all the humans and shit, and it's skinned animals, blah, blah. Then when it comes to the baby brother, and I know they don't want to kill the baby off in a movie, good, because I don't, I don't like seeing that shit. I don't think it's ever needed in movies. Unless you're telling a top of story, a realistic story about someone, you know, unfortunately with miscarriage or something. But in this case, the spotter gently comes down behind Charlotte with her knowing in its web and gently picks up the boy and then takes him and then cocoons him with the mum in the basement. What's that bullshit? That what you're telling me this spotter's like, it's just a baby, I've got to be careful. I'm not going to bite it. I'm just going to gently steal it in my web and then take it and then cocoon it. Come on. That's just silly. Hey, you're telling me a, a, an alien spider, like an animal, is going to be able to differentiate and just be nice to it because it's baby. Come on. That's just silly. There could have been different ways you could have got to that with the baby not getting hurt. It, that was just really silly, I thought. That was pretty lazy. Um, Ethan's sacrifice in the end where he knows he's going to get electrocuted because it's faulty, but also because it's wet from the sprinkler, that he's going to electrocute himself and kill himself, but it's going to be able to make the comp- compact work, and then Charlotte can use it to kill the spider, which she does. <clears throat> when, like I said, with the compactor, I knew that he was going to sacrifice himself, and that was going to be the reason why the spider gets killed. I thought was very silly. Um, yeah, not a, not a big fan of that at all. Uh, yeah, that's kind of... All my major points from that, um, we will see if Sting has any trivia. And other than that, I'll go to my final review and my scoring. Um, I mean, yeah, this is in the movie. It's not really a bit of trivia, but I did forget to mention it. Charlotte names the spider Sting after seeing a copy of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Sting is not the name of a spider in The Hobbit, rather than the sword Bilbo uses to fight the spiders. So I thought that was a really cool title uh, of the movie and also the naming of the spider. Charlotte's name is more than likely a reference to Charlotte's Web. Another story about a clever spider. Oh, look, I didn't make that connection. That's really dumb of me considering I grew up reading and watching the movies and stuff. Um, when Ethan asks Frank where he carries the nail gun while he's an exterminator, Frank answers protection. The nail gun is likely a reference to Arachnophobia, another movie about carnivorous spiders where the main character finishes one of the creatures off with a nail gun. That's what I mean about... That was definitely a reference to arachnophobia. There's a few other ones where I'm like, oh, that was maybe a subtle reference. Like I said, that character and all that was definitely a reference to the movie, which I thought was really cool. Uh, first film directed by Kia Roche-Turner to be set in the United States as opposed to his native Australia. I, I will look at his profile and see if I'm familiar with their work. Uh, in the basement, when Frank sees Sting's blood and says, if it bleeds, we can kill it. This this is clearly a nod to Predator when the classic line is spoken by Irish Something I forgot to bring up, but it is in my notes, I think. I think I just missed it. it yeah, that was the one I was like, that is 100% a line that references another movie. That's definitely the one that I thought was cool, considering I, I do love Arachnophobia and I love Predator. Um, in the basement, when Sting creeps up to Charlotte and she turns her head away in fear towards camera, this is extremely similar to a scene in Aliens 3 between the Xenomorph and Ripley. I mean... That might be a direct reference because when I watched it, I thought, okay, yeah, that's from Alien Stray, but then I also listed other movies in my head, which I can't recall now. But I don't know if that's a direct call specifically to Alien 3. It could be, but that shot isn't, yeah, isn't just um, specific to Aliens 3. Body count is five people. There you go. So, I mean, that that's a fairly decent body count for a killer animal movie, especially a spider killer animal movie. So, that's all the trivia. Uh, look at Kia Roche Turner. Kaya? Kaya? I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah. He's a Australian director. He has directed... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Wormwood, Road of the Dead, which I think I did watch when it first came out, which was 10 years ago, so I don't remember anything about that movie. Um, uh, Wormwood Seeker, which I've never seen, and another movie I've never seen. So, yeah. I mean, I hope he gets more work from this. I think it was, yeah, fairly well directed and whatnot. Um... But anyway, yeah, we'll go to the uh, final ratings, which we do here on Goose Talks Film, which is we rate the movie out of four categories. Each category is rated out of five. Then the overall score um, rating from that will then go towards end of year ratings where I'll be listing the top 10 movies uh, reviewed on the podcast and the bottom 10, which all comes down to what they're rated and blah, blah, blah. So 
if a movie's left off either list and it's really good, it's probably because I didn't cover it on the podcast. It's solely to those movies, but I will be doing Golden Goose Awards, which is my own film ceremony where I'll be doing best film, best director, blah, 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 blah. That'll be all movies released. So I'll be trying my hardest to watch as many movies as I can. Anyway, so uh, yeah, look, I thought the... Oh, sorry, and the four categories are um, directing, writing, acting, and cinematography. Anyway, yeah, I thought the directing was decent. I I mean, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't amazing, but I think I did like what he did in the apartment building and the restraints of being just one building. And yeah, I thought the establishing shots and I thought the um, whole, yeah, the whole setting of it was good. It kind of, I'm struggling to think of words right now, but yeah, anyway, I think for the director, go, I'll go a three, which might be a bit generous, but I think a three out of five is pretty good. And then we'll go the writing. Yeah, look, I think it was, you know, dot by dot, play by play, whatever you want to call it. It followed through what a lot of other killer animal, movie, killer animal movies do. Didn't really do a lot in that sense where we knew who was going to survive. We knew who was going to get killed. We knew that the animal was going to get killed by the main characters. We knew that it was going to get killed in a very unique way. Uh, and I thought the dialogue was really good. I thought the dialogue was probably the best part of it. So I'll probably go three again. Uh, I thought the acting is probably what let it down, mainly because Charlotte, she's our main character. She is the protagonist. Like I said, I already started my issues with that character. Um, I thought everyone else was convincing. I thought everyone was good. I thought Jermaine Fowler probably overacted and went over the top in the end scene, which was a bit disappointing. Uh, so I'll go a 2.5 for the acting. And... Uh, sorry, that was... F- what was that for writing? Yeah, yeah that's for sorry, that was acting. Uh cinematography. Like I said, I really enjoyed the shots. I thought they were um really good. You don't always expect that type of craftsmanship in a movie like this. So I think I'll go uh a three point two five for the movie. So I just some quick math. Eleven point seven five, if I've done that correctly. Eleven point seven five out of 20, which is exact same rating as another movie that I've reviewed, but I won't say which one. But uh, yeah, as I do more of these reviews, we'll see a lot of movies with the same ratings. I think we'll make the, the list at the end very, very uh, intriguing and, and entertaining. But anyway, I'll leave the episode there. Thanks for listening slash watching. Uh, make sure you follow Goose Talks Film on any uh, social media platform and like, subscribe, whatever you listen to me on. If it's Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube Music, you watch me on YouTube. Listen to me on Audible, whatever it is. I'm still working on getting on uh, Apple Podcasts, so please bear with me uh, so I can can reach more ears. But um, there'll be more videos produced on my YouTube channel. I'll be uh, doing movie tier lists and rankings and movie battles and all that type of stuff, as well as working on, like I said, the Golden Goose Film Awards that'll be uh, presented in January. So that'll be really cool. And uh, anyways, yeah, thank you for listening. I'll be back next week and hopefully back to another Friday episode and anyway this has been goose and as always make sure you watch those movies and i will catch